Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Wonder of Anime podcast. My name is Lisa, and I'm your host of this year's show where I talk about anime, whether I am talking about anime by myself or with the help of a amazing guest, whether they are anime content creators, podcasters, YouTubers, as well as anime voice actors and other people in the anime industry. This week, by the time that you are listening to this, I have will have already gone to Otakon, which is this weekend in D.C., right before I'm recording this. And I will be preparing to go to Megacon, which is in Orlando. Y'all, my con schedule blew the fuck up, and I am just truly, truly blessed. If you follow me on social media, you will have seen that I have been posting uh, my con schedules. And as y'all know, I go as press, I do reviews, I take cosplay pictures, I interview guests, uh, whether they are like the special guests of the convention as well as attendees of the convention. And I started this up pre-COVID and COVID put a huge stop to it. So I'm really glad to be able to start attending these cons again as press. And of course, y'all, COVID-19 and these Delta, Lambda, Sigma variants are no joke. So just know that I am keeping my distance as much as I can. I, of course, am masked up. I've been masked up. Girl, you not going to catch me without a mask as well as being vaxxed as well. So <laughs> just know I'm taking the most precautions that I can while also attending these events um, and just doing my part. But I am so excited for your, you guys to see the content that I have up that I have coming up with these conventions, as well as just content that I have coming up in general. If you guys are not following me on YouTube, I highly suggest that you head over there. I have been in my YouTube bag, girl. Your girl is out here pre-recording content, making notes, like scheduling YouTube videos. And normally I do that stuff, but I really put myself in a good position where I have weeks of videos ready to go, scheduled, you know, all that jazz. And they are just some of my favorite, favorite content to put together. So I hope that you guys are checking that stuff out. Uh, in the link to this episode, as well as on all my social medias, you can find a link that will take you to every single thing that I do. So please be sure to utilize that. Speaking of cons, I wanted to segue into this week's guest who I am so excited that I got the opportunity to talk to and we've been following each other on Twitter for a while and we actually connected for this episode. We actually have a plan uh, to talk podcast to podcast because they are part of a podcast and we have that we're planning that as well, but had to get them in early because we were actually on the timeline talking about conventions. As y'all know, Blurred Con recently just passed, which I attended in Washington, D.C., and my guest attended Dream Con, which I believe took place in Texas. Y'all gonna have to not quote me on that because I don't, your girl couldn't go. I couldn't even get in the club, so I don't know where it was, but I had the opportunity to sit and chat with GB, also known as Gene, from the Worst Gen podcast, uh, Worst Generation podcast. And he is just so smart, so intelligent, so incredible. And you'll hear this backstory in the podcast, but I actually approached him to talk about his experiences at DreamCon and just conventions in general, because he had this thread, which will be linked in the description of this episode, uh, regarding DreamCon. And his review of the convention wasn't just like, oh, I went and I had fun. It was technical. It was logistics. It was security. And as someone who kind of like geeks out over stuff like that, and I'm looking and paying attention to things. Things, not to that detail, but it really just was such a great thread. And personally, I follow, uh, been following GB for a long time. And I just love when he goes on these Twitter rants. And he is just someone who's so well put together. Like his thoughts, when he tweets them, you can tell this is somebody who puts you know, really knows how to speak and how to speak well in terms of they use words and understand that words use meaning. I feel like oftentimes, especially on Twitter or social media, like people just be tweeting and talking and you can tell it's just not carefully thought out or they're not thinking about how they're speaking or what they're coming across. And Jay, um, 
GB is just someone that I, they're one of my favorite accounts to follow on Twitter because whether it's anime, whether it's some other shit, their tweets are just always so fun for me to read and are so insightful. So in this episode, of course, as you can tell by the title, we talk about Blurred Con and Dream Con, comparing both of our experience or both of our experiences, but it is just about so much more. And we've really had a good time in this episode. I think I tell you guys all the time that I just vibe so well with the guests that I bring up on here. And I love getting DMs like you guys like, yo, it seems like you guys are best friends. Like you, the chemistry was off the rocks. Like y'all are so fun, especially my previous episode that I have with Erica. Shout out to Erica because we're actually planning to meet up very soon. I'll keep you updated on that. But you know, I appreciate when you guys let me know that you thought me and a guest had really good chemistry because oftentimes this is the first time that I'm talking to them, um, you know, via Zoom. Either we're always just talking on social media and things like that. So all that being said, I hope you guys enjoy this episode. As always, if you are listening to the episode, please be sure to share when you're listening using the hashtag TWOA pod, the wonder of anime pod, which just lets me know that you're listening, as well as the past, the, I can't even talk, I'm so excited, as well as the hashtag podin, P-O-D-I-N, which lets other black and people of color know that you're listening to a podcast made by a person of color. Ain't that some shit? But thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoy this episode. Zoom be changing shit. It never used to say that. So I always like do like my intro to the podcast post because it's just so much easier to do it that way. But so I want to start off by saying that I'm here with GB from Worst Gen Narration Podcast. I don't know why I said it like that because I was going to say Jen and then I like was like Jen Narration, <laughs> Worst Generation Podcast. And we actually... I think we've been following each other for like over a year. I think I follow most of the people from Worst Gen Pod and just like we're always interacting on Twitter. Um, so before we get to the reasons why we are podding together today, I would love if you would just tell us a little bit about yourself individually and then as well as Worst Gen Pod. Uh, well, let's see. I'm GB. Individually, uh, I am an old soul, and uh, I enjoy being on Twitter doing think pieces, as Sensei calls them. Uh, let's see. That's really about, I pretty much keep, like, my podcast life separate from my personal life. Um, I just came from DreamCon 2021, which was absolutely awesome. I met a lot of my Twitter friends in real life, and apparently the vote is saying that GB is funny in real life, so that's the agenda that I'm going to push and continue to try to be funny in real life since you guys don't find me funny on the internet or on podcast. Uh, about the Worst Gen Pod, we've been around for two years. We started off as a One Piece pod, of course, Worst Generation Podcast, and One Piece was all our favorite series. But eventually that has grown into uh, us talking about all anime and manga. And predominantly, uh, I call us an exploratory pod because... We don't really focus on one series or kind of like just characters or week to week. We focus on concepts and topics. And I try to build discussions around that. As a kid and as a young adult, anime provided me most of my lessons in my life that I grew up on uh, for lack of having those, I guess, mentors or parental figures at the time. And so uh, to this day, I still look at anime and still pull lessons from the ways that, especially manga, like stories too, uh, lessons from the ways that people interact in different environments. Uh, for instance, uh, I did my shoujo binge and my and my Jose binge a year ago as I was trying to work on developing my emotions. I start reading more stories that are from an interrelational kind of standpoint to, to have a better perspective on, you know, well, how do people act when they're happy and when they said and how do they know what they're feeling? So the pod pretty much follows that same kind of avenue where we try to pull lessons. Uh, We definitely keep it funny. It's hilarious. We slander everything. And uh, we find a way to just break shit down. I love that. And y'all be having the timeline in shambles. I think it was just today that you uh, posted something from the the pod Twitter. I think it was y'all about who got to go. Um... Tokyo oh, yeah, Revengers. Yeah. <laughs> and I, one of our one of our mutuals 
and oh my god, I'm trying to find it now. They said remove yourselves, and I was like, yeah. that was my choice. So I, I, I think that was check Mark Ray, as I call him. Uh, he, I think that was check Mark Ray. It was like y'all gotta eliminate yourselves, and that's been a trend for that. So I love to run my fade. Uh, what what Worst Gen Pod does best is we we really do. We want to have hot takes and discussion and controversy. Like we're all about engagement with the people. And Run My Fade is one of those things that I've just loved from the start. Leak has been running it on the Twitter page and it always goes crazy because it he finds a way to pit, pit people's favorites together, but it's not the same conversations you're used to having in a versus where like, well, can they beat Goku? Can they beat Sailor Moon? Uh, like shit like that. It's He finds a way to put these... Uh, these characters, these powers, these worlds together, and you can actually have some debate around it. So for the the JJK and the Tokyo Revengers one, I was interested when he said he was going to throw that up, and because um, I haven't started reading Tokyo Revengers yet, but I, I know everyone's been talking about is Gas is one of the hottest new series out. So I was interested to see what the responses look like, and Ray's response has been a common response where people have been like not y'all choosing violence or y'all got to go for this one. We need worse gen off the timeline. This is too hard. I can't <laughs> choose. Why do you hate me? And so I, I, I just love those. Cause that when you got a stumper, that's just a good convo. And that's probably something we'll bring up on the pod later, like a JJK or Tokyo Revengers, just to see where the pod may stand. Yes. I started Tokyo Revengers, but I have not, um, I saw like one episode because I was like, let me let because like I saw JJK last year as it was coming out. And I literally was like obsessed with it. I got the manga. <laughs> I haven't read it yet, but I literally was like obsessed with this, this. But I'm also like in school and I work full time and I do. So I was like, you need to relax and you need to just binge everything like on a weekend or something. So I haven't been like on weekly shit, but I saw this and I was like, this is good. I just voted though. So I feel like I like where it's going. Uh, but I, I appreciate those, like the run my fade. And one thing that I appreciate about worst gen podcast and like everything that you guys are doing is like, y'all make these conversations fun. Cause I feel like I'm somebody who's not into like debates. Like I'm just not going to argue with you because like I got my opinions and then I'll be mass sensitive. So I don't want nobody to tell me shit, but y'all make it in a way that's fun. That like, even like with the clubhouse <clears throat> stuff, it's like people feel welcome to like, want to engage and discuss like the community you've built around that. Cause something that could be a barrier is like, you know, you mentioned Goku, like God forbid you say like, Oh, I ain't watch Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> you ain't watch the pinnacle of anime. You in an anime. And you just like, bitch, like, I'm just trying to have fun. Like, yeah, so I, I just came, I just came to that. kick it. Yeah. Like you try to have a good time. Now you get in attack and quiz. And I love that. Like through all the, you know, clubhouse, all this stuff, like it's a welcoming platform form for everyone and it's fun like you don't feel like even if you don't agree no one's like yo you fucking trash get the fuck off the timeline <laughs> because of that yeah i don't i don't use the the term safe space all the time um i tend to think of it like you you engineer your space to be what it is and so uh with the pod or with anime after dark or if it's what we do on the timeline one thing I've tried to be intentional about from the start and uh, my pod mates and other people tend to have gathered around that I'm seeing uh, is that I am a person that wants to have discussion with people, but I don't take it personal. And I would notice I would go to certain areas and you, and you talk to people, you say what you got to say, but for some reason it feels like, Oh, we have to be enemies now because we disagree. And I don't believe in that just because we have a difference of opinion or you're your, your perspective is different and you're struggling kind of coming around and understanding where I'm at, it doesn't mean that we're instant enemies. This is this is one thing that we don't agree on. In the grand scheme of things, it's, it's minuscule. I mean, we're talking anime and manga here. Uh, and even for other topics, it's not a big deal. So one thing that we try to engineer, especially on Anime After Dark, because that is not pod or moderator driven. That's driven by the the guest and the fans and the, and everyone that shows up. So sometimes we don't know what the fuck we're going to get. Um, some people come up there and, you know, they're, they're really engaging and they know what they want to say and they can hold a conversation. And then other people come up there and they're kind of anxious and they've never quite had that combo. So number one for us was making sure that everyone feels comfortable coming up there at any point. And 
how do you do that? So we had to think about one, having rules, which is the first thing we go to. Um, and our rules are just very simple. It's only three rules. It's like, uh, safe space. So we want everybody to get in their bag and, and talk trash, but there's a clear line between talking trash and being funny and being offensive and disrespectful. And so we've made it clear. We've had to kick people before and let them know that, yo, that don't fly. Like you can't do that in here, but this is cool. Uh, number two is we encourage other people to build community, to follow people and, uh, network and connect with everybody that's in the chat so that they can start to feel more like family because we find that the more people that follow each other the more they start to feel comfortable opening up not just on the timeline but also on anime after dark we've had people that have come to you know multiple sessions and then they finally come up on stage and go like i've been listening to you guys for a while but i i never had the confidence to want to come up here i didn't feel comfortable until today and shout out to my friends that i made and stuff like that so that's a beautiful thing and then the last thing is uh, we have a rule that's really an icebreaker, uh, just where you from. So, and then we tell them like, they don't have to say their city or anything. Most people give a city, but even if you say like East coast, other people in the chat can relate to that and, and say like, I'm from the East coast too. I, I might like this person or we might have something in common and then give us a top three something. And the top three is always where the ice gets broken. People say something and, you know, we got some feedback or, you know, that's cap or protect this queen, whatever you may say. And that's how the conversation gets to flow and people feel comfortable. So uh, really just engineering your space and making sure that it's a place that's comfortable and reach has the results that you intended to get. Uh, but it's a constant work in progress. Like we make mistakes. Uh, we try to lead by example, but sometimes we forget that we're leading by example and we go too far and kind of damage it in that way, then we we also have to check ourselves and go back and say like, hey, like if we get to doing that, other people are going to think it's okay to do that. So we we can't do that. We can't be those people. Right. So it's it's difficult. It's, it's constantly it's constantly changing. But I like it. It's, I like the challenge of it. Yeah. And I think you guys have a really good like dynamic going. I joined one and then I was like, I'm never coming back because it was like, it's at night, so I got to wake up early the next day. And I was like, I'm going to just check in casually. Like, I came in, and then I think, like, I I was on, and I was like, I'm only going to listen for a little bit. I think I was on for, like, an hour. And then I just, like, then I got on the stage. Then, like, man, people followed me. And I was like, this is dangerous because, like, I got to go. Like, I have to go to bed. <laughs> and, like, I just kept wanting to engage. But that community aspect is is really there. And from somebody, like you know, who has then gotten followers from that and then just interacting with people, like even people, like I won't be listening, but then I'll see like the retweets, like I'm this person, I'm a content creator. Like, like I know, for example, Erica, who I just had on my podcast, um, Sundari, like she, I kind of connected through her, with her through the, um, through Anime After Dark, just because I keep seeing her like tweets and she's using the hashtag. And I usually like go through the hashtag and I follow other content creators. And like me and her, we're planning to meet up at a con in like a, like a month. So it's like, you, you <laughs> I love build. That. Yeah. And like me, we're like, <laughs> yo, it's crazy. Cause our episode, me and her discovered like our birthdays are one day apart. We both had like the same old job. Like our lives are so crazy. It's so crazy how like same, the similar, similar we are. But like through that, like I've also just, connected with other people or like met other content creators and I love what you said about like building that community because I also feel like we grow go more and you go higher and you go the distance when you are supporting people and if anything um you know when you build those connections like you can say like yeah oh I have an anime podcast but maybe you're not gonna like my style because I'm interview based let me get you the worst gen because they gonna really be out here let me get you to bland because yo Mike is gonna go crazy on some shit and then you feel like here's this whole repertoire of people that I mm -hmm. could put you on to and I and that's <laughs> yo I'm I'm that's crazy that you met Erica through. Like, that's awesome. And that's exactly what we want. Um, I think has nerds, and depending on, like, what your age and, and what generation you're in and everything, you may have lived a very isolated life in your nerdom. And so I think sometimes it's hard to really open up and, and, and accept community for what it is because it feels too good to be true sometimes. Mm -hmm. But we were trying to mimic some things when we started doing Anime After Dark. One thing that me and Mike talked about was that when we were starting out as potters, 
we didn't find many other black podcasts out there, which is kind of what inspired us to do our thing. Um, and then all of a sudden black podcasts start showing up, but it's like, how can we keep highlighting all these podcasts? Cause uh, me personally, I feel like I have the best podcast, but I might not be the best to every person that comes along. And so there are other podcasts. You have Mike Check, Waifu, Waifu. You got Project Manga that's out there. You you got uh, Black Girls Anime, who sometimes does pods, sometimes does content. You got the Sailor Moon podcast, which I personally have come to really like with her interviews and everything she does. She always has a good guest that's dropping gems. So depending on the fan that's coming to me, I don't just want to be able to say I have the best podcast, listen to this, because it might not be best for you. But if you tell me, hey, I'm into these things, like you said, I can recommend these other pods to you. Uh, and then we definitely wanted people to just connect through there. We wanted content creators to be able to, you know, build. And we always tell them people, drop your information and everything with the hashtag so everybody can follow you, so everybody can listen to you. Uh, but that's how my whole podcast journey kind of started. Uh, I, I wanted to do a pod. I was working for two other pods um, and was having a whole dilemma of ethics with one of the, one of my bosses at the time. And uh, it just wasn't working out. And at the time, my, my girlfriend kept telling me like, you should just do an anime podcast. I'm like, no, nah, I don't even know. Like I would want to do it with people. I was real just pathetic about it. I <laughs> didn't want to touch it. And so uh, Sensei comes along and he drops in one of the Nuke chats we in, he drops his YouTube link, like just started my YouTube and all that. Uh, and so we, that's how we connected originally was through a Kappa chat. And so we start talking, we add each other to this Greeks and Geeks chat. Then we get into One Piece chat, like two or three months go by and I go, let's do a podcast. In that time, me and Sensei, like you and Erica find out we have all these things in common uh, our birthday is the exact same day. Oh my God. <laughs> our birthday is the exact same day. One Piece is both our favorite series. We both noobs. We think about some things in a similar way. Our personalities are different, of course, but there are a lot of parallels between us. And without having this community and everything around us, we would never know those things. And then as I brought in the other podcasters, Leek and Rome, uh, we were the original four. I'm finding out I have all these things in common with Leek and Rome too. And so I've always wanted to foster that for everybody. And that's all I want to see. Uh, I do believe that as we do Anime After Dark, some of our topics will be, I guess, controversial because I believe in having discussion and, and trying to like see things through, but not everyone has that same mindset. I do understand that some people kind of feel like, well, this don't need to be talked about. It just is what it is. But I personally don't believe that. I think that we should be talking about everything because everyone's not just black and white. And some people might be afraid to speak up on a topic that they aren't on the same wave as everyone else. And so I want to try to foster environments where people can like say their piece and add that perspective because I think perspective is everything. Yeah. And I, I think too, with what you're saying, like, it's okay. Like, I guess, you know, obviously controversial content, like this controversial, but anime shapes is just like any other form of media that shapes your understanding. And we look at movies and TV as like, you know, these are what is giving us examples and this is what is leading. And I think for me, like something that I always like focus on is like storytelling because like I started my my podcast turned four this year and it wasn't always about anime. It just well, I think, you know, I'll be out here. Um, <laughs> but no, so it like transitioned, but I, my, my focus was always storytelling, right? Because like, that's where we find those connections. And that's the one thing I've always loved anime all my life. And like what you said earlier, like a lot of us have been anime fans, but by ourselves or like nerd, um, having that nerd them by ourselves. And like, it wasn't until I got to college where I had a friend that not only watched anime, but experienced anime in the same way that I did. Because, you know, I like that. That's my best friend. It's my soulmate. Like me and her, like we be watching something and we don't be like, oh, that fight was amazing. We be like, yo, that shit's crazy. <laughs> like what the, blah, blah, blah. and it's like, you don't like, you need to see people having those conversations the same way that you have in those conversations. Exactly. And, and it's funny. And we're going to get into this because the, what I wanted to talk to you was about our con experiences because you know, I recently met, uh, two went to, I didn't go to DreamCon. Unfortunately, I went to 
not I didn't go to DreamCon, unfortunately. I went to BlurredCon, um, which we'll get into. That's also another controversial topic. But then I met one of my mutuals who I had on the podcast. And it was like hanging out with her in person was just like a dream come true. Because it's like, I only have one anime friend in person. So to have somebody else <laughs> like that's crazy about anime and like she's putting me on to stuff, like you build those communities. So it's like awesome when you have that. And it's so funny you said like you had... um. You, you and Sensei through the noob chat because when I was in college, I was in Greek life. I wasn't in um uh like POC or uh, like a Divine Nine org, but I was mad cool with the Kappas. And like me, the Kappa chapter at my school was like like we were all it they were small and like all the people of color, regardless where they were, like they all like got together because we were at like a PWI. So it's so funny. Same, same. <laughs> so like, you know, even if like people had different letters or people in different organizations, like we was all mad cool. And like a lot of the people in the Kappa chapter, like we still in touch or whatever. So it's always just like cool when, when those kind of things, it's like, oh shit, like we have this in common, but we also have all these other things in common too. Same. Uh, definitely went to PWI too, uh, Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Uh, fun fact: the whole Southern Illinois area still has like sundown towns. Uh, so there's a very concentrated black population there. And if you're black, I think you can definitely have the feeling that this is a predominantly black school, but it's not. The numbers are so low, and it's amazing how you walk around campus and you see mostly black people i don't get it and if for somehow we don't cross paths with other with like other folks but when it comes to greek life i crossed with everybody and like we became cool with uh other people of color and i wouldn't have had that experience if not for greek because i don't i don't i wasn't in spaces where i'd be around those people if not for greek life and now i'm interacting with the lambdas and um you're interacting with the teaks and 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 other fraternities and sororities that aren't a part of the d9 and <clears throat> that whole experience kind of like changed my perspective on or began to change my perspective that in world travel on what really is safe to me and what type of spaces that I want to be in or that I feel comfortable in. Cause before that I was pretty much, I'm from the South side of Chicago, like in Roseland. So most of my interactions with people have always been black. Um, I was yanked. I was extremely smart. So I was yanked out of class a lot and they took me to, better schools which was normally all white kids and um but that gave me kind of like a a, a, a sour taste in my mouth because I didn't talk to any of the kids the teachers treated me different it didn't feel right so whenever I had the opportunity I was always in predominantly black spaces and it wasn't until like Greek life in college at a PWI that I was kind of saying okay this is not all bad I have to be more thoughtful about what's actually bad and what's not bad and kind of like broaden my horizons. And that was important to me. Yeah. And it, it, you reminded me of this episode of this podcast called The Friend Zone. And one of the hosts had a very similar experience where she was, um, she's Black and she was in a, um, like she grew up in New York and she got taken out of like the hood schools, quote unquote. And, you know, taken to this private institute where like, you know, all the, like these famous people's kids were going to, and she was there on scholarship. And then she talks a lot about like, yeah, okay, you're in this better school, but nobody talks about like that effect that that has on somebody who is a person of color, who is black. It sucks. Cause you, you go into this nice school, but then you come at home and you going back to the neighborhood with the kids that would have been at the school that you would have been at. And now people at the school, you don't fit in because you're here on scholarship. You're the person of color. You're the black kid. And then at home, you don't fit in because, oh, you going to the white school. You with the white people. Like this shit brings people complexes. And you it's talk, stuff you that talk people don't proper, talk about. Bro? What is that? So and like, God yeah, forbid you, you do that. Cause now you white. Yeah. Oh, you sound white. Like, bitch, how? These are some big ass words. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you don't get in. You, I don't get along with my neighborhood friends at the time when I was young, young. It Somewhere around like sixth grade, seventh grade, I had it down and I had made friends in the neighborhood. So it was just like, he that smart kid. Um, but you don't get along with neighborhood kids at first. You don't get along with the kids in a new school. You can't talk to any parents or adults about it because that whole generation ahead of us is like, we put you in a better place. You should be grateful and you should be happy. Like, there are no problems there. You know what I would have done to be in your space? And I was like, no, I, I don't know what you would have done to be in my space. I think this is quite miserable. And maybe you don't understand what it's like being in this space because you haven't been there. But 
yeah, it was a conversation that you couldn't have with anybody. It took me to around like seventh, eighth grade to kind of really process how to straddle that line and be, I guess, cold switch, like, mm-hmm. and, and be fit in in all these places. Listen, it's a thing. And I feel like that in itself could be another podcast because <laughs> I feel like people don't realize that. But I did want to talk to you because you went to DreamCon and you did mm-hmm. this whole thread, which first of all, I just, this is just me. How do you type with every letter capitalized? Like, that's it's crazy. Something it's something I've been doing since I got my first cell phone, like way, <laughs> way back when. And the thought was, I was trying to break out of, I guess the term now is social anxiety. Mm-hmm. And back then I didn't really have no words for it. I, I was just being, I was just being a lame. I was being a chump. I was scared. <laughs> uh, but I was trying to break out this feeling where I was afraid to speak up and say things. And so I started telling myself, you got to make every word count. Every word should count. Oh. And so at the time, my thing was, I'm going to just capitalize every word. So the the physical mind action of me having to go in on a T9 texting phone and capitalize every word made me think about the words I was using. And when I would speak up, it helped me be intentional and actually make sure if I was going to say something, it mattered enough for me to do all the extra work of typing. It's something that just stuck with me over time and I just never looked back. Uh, it's not something, somebody asked me, was it like a brain tick? But it's not because if I, if I write a corporate email at work. Yeah, you're not going <laughs> to. It's, it's regular font. If mm. my boss texts me, it's regular font for the most part. Sometimes I forget I'm texting my boss and I do the first letter of every word. But for the most part, uh, it's just something that just stuck with me as I went on and I just never changed it. Uh, and I've been doing that for like two and a half decades. No, two decades at this point. Because <laughs> I was like, I peeped it in the one two. thread and I was like, oh, wait, this is every single. I'm like, you got some time. To do. <laughs> but I love that mental like for yourself. And I love the thought because words mean things. According, you know, people forget that, but words actually mean things. So the fact that you had that like mechanism for yourself is just chef's kiss. Chef's kiss. Yeah, it helped me. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, it's muscle memory. I don't, I don't even think about it. And I it's don't like feel your like thing. it affects my typing speed that fast because now we have uh, QWERTY keyboards. So I don't feel like it's really killing the vibe for me mm-hmm. to do it. Uh, when I look at other people text, I'm pretty much in the same texting range speed wise. Well, I, it definitely is unique to you. And I appreciate it. I just just like, what? How the hell? Because I know like if you type a word, you can make it so that everything you type. But like I'm like on a phone. Can you do that? But the the point was that you got this thread about your thoughts about DreamCon. And then I chimed in with some of my feedback from BlurredCon because I feel like Blurred con happened and then dream con happened. And then the timeline was like dream con versus blurred con like, and rightfully so in a, in a sense, like, I feel like there was a lot of stuff that happened that we're going to get into. Um, but before I ask about your dream con experience, what is your con experience in general? Have you been going to cons for years? Like what has your con journey been like? Uh, I'm from Chicago. So of course I've been going to C2E2 when I've been to a comic con or to, uh, I lived in LA. I went to Anime Expo out there. I went to a little no-name con in West Midland, Texas, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it was about half the size of DreamCon, but I had one of my favorite times there, just meeting random rednecks that was into like nerdum, which was very strange and weird. Uh, and then I've been in and out of like other like small alleyway cons and stuff. This DreamCon is my first con has what I'll call myself a professional, like as a podcaster, and me approaching it from that standpoint. It's my first non, just purely fan. I'm here to buy a couple things and and fanboy out type experience. That's cool. I recently got into the con space. I started going in 2019, and I had never been to a convention or anything like that before, and then through, you know, doing my podcast, I was like, well, maybe I can start going like as press and, you know, review and cover cons because I kind of was doing that locally with different local events. Um, And then I started going to the the conventions and then obviously COVID put a stop to everything. Um, And then this year, Blurred Con um, 
was my first con post COVID. And I've gone to some bigger cons like before everything happened. Like there's one here, I'm in Pennsylvania. So there's one that's like the Keystone Comic Con, which is average and it's like huge. Um, so I had like that experience, but this is my first time being back in a con space, a big con and a specifically a con that was geared towards black nerds and people of color, uh, safe, quote, safe, safe for everyone. Uh, so with DreamCon, I had, didn't really hear about DreamCon until everything was sold out. And like, I was like, oh my God, like <laughs> if I wanted to go too bad, girl, you missed it. So <laughs> with, um, with you going to DreamCon, was this your first con also to like post COVID? Uh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> And did you go um, like as press or you just like bought your tickets and then you did this review? I brought my ticket and did this review. Uh, I wanted to. So I originally applied for DreamCon 2020 before before the pandemic and everything broke out. I had already I think I had already purchased my ticket, maybe or I brought it at the start. I can't remember. But we had applied for. uh, uh, For press then and I had put in. I put in for a panel back then. And so when DreamCon 2020 was canceled, it was my understanding that all of that would just carry over to DreamCon 2021. But it didn't quite work that way. Uh, I don't know if it was just they decided to make everybody reapply or if there was like a a gap in the information of what was established and what wasn't. But uh, I just missed out on 2021. I would have loved to be press and uh, host a panel. I definitely think... um, next year you definitely got to be on that um because your your review was just uh like i i'm very like into reviews <laughs> and when i go to cons i too because you know doing the press and stuff and i I liked your review because I was seeing a lot of like positive, amazing things about DreamCon, which I am forever sad that I was not there. But I also too feel like there is stuff that just the technical side, like I'm very interested in. And those things, you know, really make, like you make your own con experience. Like if you meet up with people, you attend panels, cosplay, all that stuff. But then there's also those things too that do play a factor because cons aren't cheap. So you're paying to get this experience. And if certain things aren't up to your, you know, your standards or things that you didn't like. So I, you, you were, I feel like one of the first, and I did see some more afterwards, like more like thought out technical reviews that covered every single aspect of like your con experience. So overall, how was your con experience? Overall, my con experience was absolutely amazing. I don't really do ratings all the time, but if I had to, nine out of 10, it was spectacular from, has both. Uh, and I And I think mainly for me being, a first time producer creator that was in that space that put it over the top for me. Um, that really made it special because DreamCon really has that hustle, get it out the mud spirit about it. You have all these creators that are there. We're all, we're mostly black. Cause there are, there are other non black people there, but we're mostly black people are at different layers uh, or different levels in their career. So you're meeting people that are where you are. You're meeting people that are just starting out. You're meeting people that have, hit success and then you're meeting those superstars i guess you want to call them and so when you're meeting people at those different levels you're seeing kind of different versions of what you could be or what things could be and that's really inspiring when you can set a path in front of yourself so dreamcon definitely has that air and that spirit to it and unlike bigger conventions an advantage that dreamcon has is that even though it's smaller it that, that smallness adds intimacy. You mm-hmm. feel very close to these people. You feel like I can do this too. It's not too far away. And reachability is one thing I think a lot of people undervalue when it comes to kind of meeting your dreams and meeting success. Uh, it's hard to look at like a Jay-Z or Kanye and say, I'm going to be there. But if you can look at the local rapper that's just like blew up in your city you can kind of look at that with a little bit more confidence and say, I'm going to be there. And then once you're there, now you may start looking at Jay-Z and Kanye saying, I'm going to get there next. So DreamCon really gives that spirit and that makes it special. 
you, I feel like you just took like a page from my mind because I say that all the time in terms of like looking to your peers as like inspiration and motivation. Like, obviously we all have like our celebs that we enjoy and that we follow, but like too, like I get inspired. Like you mentioned the Sailor Moon Fan Club podcast, like me and Victoria, we met, that's another person that we have a meetup planned. Like, and I look up to my peers in that space. So I love that you had that experience um, with DreamCon where everybody, you know, and it's crazy because I'm like watching all my mutuals on the timeline, like, yo, black girls anime, yo, black anime, yo, Virgin, <laughs> like, and I'm just like, and then you see, you know, everybody meeting, um, like the dream world crew, like, you know what I mean? Like RCDC, yeah. like everybody is, is coming together. And that to me is just like, I immediately saw that I feel like a difference from blurred con um but blurred con was like very big it, that mm. I saw um and they also didn't have a lot of like bigger names that I was familiar with in terms I think last year like because I was looking at it pre-COVID, um, they were going to have like a, a huge, like like a lot of anime guests and stuff in the in 2020. But obviously since that got pushed out, I feel like they didn't um, re, like rebook that stuff. Um, I did want to ask, because I saw this from like you, but then I, oh, I, I feel, was it like, there was like some controversy or something with like one of the creators that was there, like, I don't know. Maybe mm. I'm. I'm trying to find your thread. <laughs> so okay. Um, yes, I, I I don't know if it's really what the creator because, um, and and I'm not a hundred percent on all the facts. But what I what I do know is what I can share. So um, there is the creator. Uh, the Twitter name is is Zero and Bless, and he's known as Anime Bay. I know it's the screen name, and that is the name that was on all the works at uh, at DreamCon. And so uh, there have been tales in the Twitter community and lots of other like indie black mangakas have spoken about it on the timeline about how uh, his designs have been ripped off or that, you know, parts of the story has been bothered, uh, borrowed and it's not really his work. Um, and then also that he's a fraud. So I've seen it on the timeline. Uh, I can't really like bear witness to all of that. I just know what I do know. I know that I reached out to him before uh, and my page was blocked for a small amount of time after that. And then it was unblocked, which was strange to me. And then uh, at the convention or before the convention, uh, I did read the manga Akai that he had out. And it, to me, it was, it's unfinished. It's a muddled mess. Um, the the story makes no sense. It kind of jumps around. It does feel like someone just mashed together a bunch of concepts and called it a chapter because it's it's not cohesive. And then I know that there's a, he had a trailer that he dropped and the first like minute and 17 seconds, I think was like, uh, like storyboarding and mm -hmm. unfinished like animation. And then last minute, and some change is all just like gifs and some weird videos. And so that's supposed to be the trailer for the anime. And so for me, this is a person that uh, no shame that you're, you're making your way up and you're, you're putting things together. But I feel like this is a person that's, or it feels that it's false. Like you're presenting that you're this, but like the proof of concept that you keep putting in front of me feels very unpolished and very unfinished. So at the convention, there was a, I didn't know he was the speaker for this particular panel when I went. There was a panel that was uh, how to break into the anime industry. Of course, me as a podcaster that's really trying to up my game, this is the this is what I'm going to because I'm trying to be in those spaces. Um, I get there. He's one of the speakers with White Manga, and they get to talking. The I left early. I couldn't do it anymore. I, I really did not enjoy the panel. There was no structure. Uh, White Manga did drop some gems here and there, but Anime Bay, I feel like, detracted from my entire experience. Uh, he didn't have much of value to add to the situation other than uh, kind of like, this just really what I do. But it's, it's no tangible tips or tangible steps. And there was no, this has actually worked. It was just a lot of, I pitched or I did this, so you got to be ready to do this. But there was no proof of success. There was no proof of concept ever given at any point during the panel. And that plus the lack of structure just really, it killed the whole thing for me. 
Uh, so as I said in my thread, my problems with that was uh, I wish they would have vetted better to have someone talk about a topic that they actually could talk about and speak knowledge to. And to his defense, to say so it doesn't just feel like I'm slandering him just for the fact of slandering him. Um, I do know that he, like, one thing I said, I do know that he put his manga up on Amazon Prime and other sites like that. I would have been okay if he threw a panel that was just about how to get your manga in places that can sell. Like, talk about things that you've actually done. Um, don't present me a panel and then you're ba you're basically Twitter in front of mm -hmm. me. You're just, you tell, you're regurgitating things to me that, like, should mean something, but because they're coming from your mouth, you can't even connect them and make them make sense. Uh, so that was that was painfully obvious. Uh, so that was one, like, I feel like they should have vetted them. And two, that was a main stage panel, which was a problem for me because uh, I, I don't feel like as a convention, you should have someone on the main stage representing you if they're not ready. And this guy just did not feel ready. No, I, I think that's all valid. So I have followed him like last year, you know, when people are like promoting everybody. And then I think maybe like two months ago, like I was just seeing a lot of my mutuals, like sharing information about how his stuff seems to borrow from other people, him blocking anybody that calls him out. And like, and like people literally be like, I just got blocked. Like I'll, you know, I just asked the question blocked. And for me, that's kind of shady. Cause I, obviously you're entitled to your own social media experience. You don't owe anybody anything, but you as creators, like people are allowed to be critical of us and mm -hmm. our work, you know, if they're being respectful and if you, and like, I would see some people like, just be like, literally like a harmless question or whatever blocked. And I'm like that to me, like if you block it, everybody like that's, that's shady. So yours wasn't the only tweet that I saw about that, but I didn't realize that it was a main stage panel. So were those like panels that were more heavily promoted by the con or they were just like the bigger, like the bigger spotlight on those panels? Uh, the bigger spotlight, I would say. So the way the convention was set up is that it was in two buildings. So you had the gaming arena and then you had the Sheraton Hotel, which was uh, you literally step out the side door to game, gaming arena, cross the parking lot, and then you're at the hotel. The hotel had several panels that were going on upstairs in the conference rooms. And we'll refer to those as the, the secondary panels or the smaller panels, whichever you want to say. And then in the gaming arena, there was a giant room where they had the opening and the closing ceremony. And then they had other panels that occurred. The reason we're calling that main stage is because the, the Titan Tron TVs and all of the, the glitz and the gadgets, there's a VIP section in there. There's lots of seating room. There's a DJ studio. Like you should have your, your main events that are happening in this room at all times. And so uh, the, for instance, and, but I, I have to always like add this disclaimer, regardless of how you felt about uh, Griffey or Heavenly or any of those people, their panel should have been in the main room for the, the amount of crowd that it attracted. And they actually dropped gems as creators. Uh, they might miss up on a lot of content, but the actual like operations and the process that goes into being a creator, they dropped gems there. So I would have took that as a main stage panel over what I got from Anime Bay and unfortunately White Monger, because like I said, I felt like he really did give tangible advice, but it's overshadowed when the person talking next to you is cutting in and then you kind of forget what you said, you know, because they're not bringing your points home. They're not adding value to what happened. Yeah, I, I feel that. And I feel like I said, me and you, I feel like we're a very similar wavelength. I feel like those are things that people definitely need to put in consideration when putting together panels, when putting together things, because not everybody is a good interviewer. Not everybody is a good interviewee. Just because you have a platform, just because you have like, you know, fame or any type of notoriety, like that doesn't guarantee that you're going to be somebody that other people want to listen to. And if you're not you know, I, I, I wasn't there, so I can't, you know, I don't really have any opinions, but if somebody is not, if they're not detracting to the point or, you know, they're not answering questions, like then whoever was moderating, like, then you need to have a strong moderator and be like, okay, but back to this question, or, you know, can you elaborate more on that? Because I, I, I 
I like the the panels. Uh, my experience at Blurred Con was the first time that I really went to panels because when I went to cons before, I kind of was just walking around taking pictures of cosplayers and and yeah. stuff. And I I think every single um, panel that I went to was good except for one. I don't know how this person got vetted in this panel, but we'll <laughs> talk about that. Um, and like you know, it is if there's a moderator, then there is, and as somebody who has been a moderator for like panels and stuff, it, you need to have that type of control. But it does a disservice, and I completely agree with you. You're putting this on the main stage where all lives are on, so people, you want people to listen to that. But what are you giving to the people if? Like the person either whether they are a fraud or not, but then they're not providing insight because a lot of us creators do attend panels like that kind of to get information on maybe this can be something that I can attain. And if you're not giving me those details, what's the point of this panel? I will say an interesting thought that popped in my head after a conversation I was having with uh, somebody that was in the, the dream b and as we called it at DreamCon. Uh, Tears. I wasn't there. <laughs> moment of silence for my sadness they they brought up how does this guy succeed like how did he get in with because he's he's in with rdc board and these other large creators like how does this guy get in and other creators don't and it really made me consider the gap that sometimes happens where it's all about who you meet and at what time so you literally can get in with large creators and small creators underneath you won't get hurt so all these people that are like may have things to say about him or may call call his character or his ability, not even character, his ability to host a panel into question. Their voices aren't large enough to, to matter once you're in with certain people. And so uh, when they brought that up, it made me think like, well, I definitely could see him, you know, because once you're cool with somebody, you're just like, hey, let me get on this panel. Like, I'm so-and-so and you know me. And it's like, okay, bet. Like, you do have some notoriety. Go get on the panel. But uh and just a quick aside, my, my background is in continuous improvement, project management, like operation development, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So if I'm the person that's engineering this space, because that's just going to be the phrase I use this whole pod, uh, I say like, cool, you can be on the panel. But if you're a streamer, I feel comfortable saying, all right, you don't have no structure, nothing, but I know you stream every night. And you good at working off the fly, like you're going to make it happen. I'm a little bit more comfortable with that. But if you're not like a streamer or someone that has just lots of experience getting up in front of a crowd of people, talking constantly, doing media, doing interviews, I need some type of structure from you. I, I need you to present beforehand what it is you're going to talk about and how that's going to go. Uh, you brought up actually leaning on the moderator. There wasn't a moderator for this conversation that's missing so it's small details like that, that that disappear from the from the actual operation and it damages the customer experience which is the correct term that you want to use when it comes to events or any, or anything right now uh customer experience is kind of a buzzword but the customer experience is now damaged because these people are coming here they have certain expectations uh and you have a way to make that clean and easy for them to consume digest and then report out to other people but those little small things that get missed, they make they make it hard. So uh, we ended up, like I said, walking out of that panel. Uh, we went to what's what was the next panel I went to? Uh, oh, I went to I I ended up at a panel with the otaku's Afro tacos, and they were just basically doing like a versus, and that was good. That that was just like crowd engagement. And so I actually enjoyed that more than I enjoyed the other panel. I felt like I kind of wasted my time being in the other panel uh, because it, it just it just didn't add value. Listen, that is real. And I I love your lens. And like I said, that's why I really appreciated your thread because there's a lot of things that come together to bring a, pan, a, a convention or anything. Like there are podcasts with people that you love and then the podcast fucking sucks because everyone's talking over each other. You know, there's not that structure. And to not everybody's going to peep those things, but they do make a difference. And your thread, like I said, was I, I was looking for it and I was like, God damn, you tweet a lot because I had to then go into my tweets to find it because I could not find it on your page. <laughs> but I found you gotta it. Do a, you got to do advanced search. That's my new move. Um, I do tweet a lot now. And love it. I love your tweets. <laughs> I, I, I've never been a social media person this heavy like this. It's, 
when Twitter first came out, yeah, but Twitter's been the only app I've ever been as active on. And so like I do tweet a lot now. Advanced search is my best friend. I've been you getting can, better at it, but yeah, you can type in the <laughs> ad name and type in some keywords and it'll pull up some tweets. And that's pretty much how I move now. I bookmark stuff for episodes if I know I gotta come back to it. That see, that's a that's a smart tip. I thought I had it in I was like, oh, it's good. I thought you had it pinned. So I was like, oh, all right, but I found it. That's the, the most important part. But like I said, I really appreciated your insight too, because that's kind of the stuff I was looking at when I was at Blurred Con. And I was going to do, and I still am gonna do a Blurred Con review um because I attended as press and there was a lot of controversy after blurred con um rightfully so I I personally think in my opinion like I think everything that happened was deserved and I appreciated mm-hmm. those people but it was crazy because I went to blurred con and I had like an amazing time. Like I literally like this was probably the best con that I've ever attended. Like some of the things that you were pointing out if, about Dream Con and not like pitting them against each other, but just the things that you pointed out were things that I was noticing because I've gone to some like smaller cons as well. So mm-hmm. I saw that Dream Con, I mean, excuse me, Blurred Con had these things. And I was like, damn, kudos to y'all. Like, you know, the safety and feeling like, of like panels were well teched. Like I literally, and I went to panels too that I felt would help me with my brand, you know, with the wonder of anime stuff. And I thought that I got a lot of good information. So your uh, thread really helped me kind of look at and like, look at those things. But then what had happened was like, I was on such a high, I didn't go to the cosplay thing or anything like that. Because like I said, I met up with, um, shout out to Naja from Blurdy Otome. She's from the area where Blurred Con's at. So we met up and we just hung out the entire con. Like we just went to panels together and, you know, talking to different cosplayers and things like that. So I got home from the con, not like on this super high, go on social media. And it was like, oh no, this, because while I was there and you know, I was also, I will say moving around. I wasn't in the same place. I wasn't sitting and like just chatting with a lot of different people. Um, I didn't hear anything about this. So like, I didn't know, you know, that like, and for those who aren't aware, the bird con, um, controversy, quote unquote, I don't like calling it a, I I feel like calling it a controversy denote the, like takes away from the fact that I think what happened was fucked up, um, where it is a blurred con means black nerd. (laughs) So, um, and a, a white person won the cosplay, um, contest so people were like how's a white person winning a cosplay content where it's supposed to be blurred con black nerds and then i feel like that was bad enough and then like the judges started chiming in and Mm -hmm. they were like oh this you know we based it on this and it didn't even make sense and so that was something that i got home and i saw and that like put such a bad taste in my mouth because i had such a great experience and i was like yo i do not fuck with this at all because i saw the winner at like around and i didn't know Mm -hmm. i'm like a huge card captor soccer fan and no shade to her like in terms of her like her cosplay like it was good but did it deserve to win no um even if it wasn't a blurred con experience like let's say this was just at a regular con that isn't geared towards black or or poc that still wouldn't to me have won like there was just so many better options but that completely like i felt like very sad when i when this happened because other than that like i feel like tech it was amazing you know the their whole process they wanted everybody to be vaccinated they wanted people to have masks and i feel like they really you know took those steps and i feel like they had that yeah. handled very well i there were no technical issues that i experienced it was hot as hell but it was i mean this dc <laughs> You know, and and being that it was a space of mostly black and POC, like it wasn't musty because I know, you know, some cons be musty with people. We're not going to say, you know, I didn't have any musty experiences. I felt like with the guests that they did have, I thought they did a really good job of promoting them. But then this whole thing and then it just it was just very sad because other than this thing, it really put a bad taste in my mouth. And then not just that that happened, but then the response one from the judges Two, then you have like the organizers not really putting yeah. out a statement. And that to me is like you as the or like y'all are all spicy on your social media game 
two, three weeks leading up to the con, oh, we not letting unvaxxed people. We trying to keep everyone safe. Now it's crickets. So which one is it? So I felt like to me, I, and the reason I wanted to talk to you about that, I don't know, you know, what you're, you weren't there either, but like your experiences on that coming from having this great experience at DreamCon, if you had any kind of thoughts about that from an outsider point of view where you weren't, you know, you weren't there, but you're seeing everything, we're on the same timeline. So we're seeing everything unfold together. Uh, so I got, I got a couple things and uh, just stop me if I go too long, right? Uh, number one is, and not to pit them to, against each other, uh, for BlurCon, we linked up on the tweet when I said, I actually didn't see much about BlurCon outside the controversy. Let me go find these other tweets and see what it looked like. What I noticed from BlurCon was that it was a conference that has been at a size of scale already. And so they had some polishes and some fine touches that were there that DreamCon didn't have. But that's not a knock to DreamCon because DreamCon has taken a huge step from the size of a convention they had before this. And, and this is actually showing that DreamCon can play ball on a different level. And I love that for them. So of course, inherently, there are gonna be some missteps and things that they probably couldn't have planned for, or couldn't have thought of unless they like shelled out from for some five-star consulting organization that was gonna charge them out the hoo-ha to do that event, you know? Uh, so that was one thing I noticed that DreamCon had a lot of the whistles and bells on it that you would expect from a convention. It's unfortunate that the controversy overshadowed it. Going into that topic, back to the whole space engineering, for me, when we when I talk safe spaces or anyone discusses a safe space to me, the only attribute I apply to it is that it's a space that's literally set up for me to feel safe. I, I don't apply things to it like everyone has to be black or, um, you know, you can't have any white people in this space or I, I don't put that on it because I've been in a lot of different spaces. I've been in all black spaces, black owned and black managed where they tried to take advantage of us. I've been in white spaces where they really looked out for me. Uh, for instance, right now, um, I work in aviation and my boss, who's a white lady, um, we're having a meeting and and shout out to her because this is, this is a stat that I love. Anyone that's ever worked for her in 25 years has always been promoted. She's never had anyone be fired or quit. Or no, she's had people quit. Like people take new jobs elsewhere. But if you've worked under her, you've been promoted. She really cares about her people and she finds a way to get them up there. I love that about her. So uh, she's a white woman. We're in aviation, which is predominantly white male. Um, and so we're having a conversation in one of our one-on-ones discussing like planning out for the week. And I can't even remember what I said. I said something, but in her, it triggered that I would like to meet her mentor is a black man who's managed four major airports in the States. And I had no clue what his name was. I had never heard of him, anything like that. But based on what I mentioned, she connected us on LinkedIn and was like, Hey, I think you guys should know each other. Uh, you know, I want Eugene to have this relationship with someone that's been higher up at the airport at that level. So now I have a connection with this black man. And then she's been strategically connecting me with other black men in the space. And the only reason she knows all of these black men is because the first guy she connected me to was her mentor. And he took her to a black aviators conference. And so because he took her to that Black Aviators Conference, she met all these people there. And now she's in a position where she can connect me with these people and help broaden my career and broaden my perspective in the space. So she set it up to where, yes, she might be a white person, but her intentions and her actions and the way that she's engineered her space has made it safe for people like me to come in and grow and learn. And so when I think safe space, those are the attributes that I want. When it comes to BlurCon, I think, Operationally, it had a lot of things right, but one thing you need to have when it comes to making a space is you need intention, and it that intention has to be there. And none of the materials or the documents or anything that I've seen was it ever. This is a space for our people. We're highlighting our people. This is for us, um, and for us can mean only us, or it can mean we're priority, and there will be other people here, but we're a priority. So comparing that to DreamCon. I hope that people don't start putting DreamCon on a pedestal as 
the black nerd experience and expecting that it will be black only. I, I don't expect that to come from DreamCon, uh, but I do expect that it will remain highlighted as a black experience. Uh, with that being said, with, if we look at the cosplay competitions, for instance, where has Blur kind of set up in a way where the power structure is very much like what we're used to and what we don't like. All the power lies with these judges to kind of look at you, make their make their judgment calls, and based on how the system is set up, apparently this girl who's a really good seamstress and, and put a lot of technical work into her outfit won the competition, which is a valid decision when I talk to other cosplayers, professional cosplayers. If you look at DreamCon, uh, shout out to Tata Poodle, who was on the cosplay committee and helped organize that, uh, put put those things together. And uh, I forgot her name, but the actual cosplayer, the person who organized everything, she reached out to me based on my thread and gave me some insight. When you look at DreamCon, the way they set it up is that they have awards. So, so say the girl was at DreamCon instead of BlurCon. She probably still would have won the technical award. The, the costume is just if it's technically if it's pristine you're going to win but then they also had the fan vote aspect of it they had the judges favorite they had the performance aspect of it so it's set up in a way where um this person may win rightfully so for like performance but we have other things going on and we're still making sure our people are a part of it so the fan vote uh could have been a, could have been one of the black cosplayers. The performance could have been one of the black. Like there are lots of opportunities out there to spread out what's happening. It all doesn't reside with those four judges who clearly, um, based on their comments on Twitter, it didn't feel like they had our best interest at heart either. I can't. I don't know them personally, but just based on what I read through Twitter, it didn't. It felt condescending, and it felt like, well, if if y'all black folks get y'all shit together, then y'all too. Can win a mm-hmm. cosplay competition, but since you ain't got your shit together, then that's why she won. And to me, that's the same as saying she basically had more resources than we have traditionally, which is true. And so that's why she won, which is, to me is the same power system I experienced outside of my black safe space. And now I have to deal with that here. So that's my biggest issue with BlurCon is that I don't think they did enough to actually focus on prioritizing and highlighting the black experience and making sure that it was a safe space. But then again, I'm not sure that was ever their intention because I haven't seen anything that said that they set out to do that. Right. And that, and you bring up a lot of great points that I feel like people were saying, and I, I until now really didn't chime in on anything publicly just because I didn't have all the information at hand. And one thing that I did see is that You know, a lot of people were saying like, all right, y'all saying this is what you were judging on. Y'all didn't make that clear to people, you know, like it wasn't expressed like, okay, these are the the aspects. And I would have expected more from a bigger convention than either if you're going to not have different categories, then specifically say, all right, we're judging people on X, Y, Z. Because then I did see, Mm -hmm. you know, that the person people were saying like she made her costume by hand, everything by hand. Mm -hmm. But then that one judge was like. She she basically insinuated like, oh, you know, this was somebody who made everything. It wasn't a store bought cost. Did y'all say it was a cosplay cost like contest that wasn't for store bought people? Like, you know what I mean? Like, y'all didn't make that stuff clear, but then you do want to. It turns into that, like coming at people for what they have. Like that was never expressed to people, and you can't get upset when people don't. You know, people are upset with your judging when it was never made clear, and I feel like. I get that that judge was, you know, they're just trying to defend themselves from where they come from. But that feel like just made everything worse. Like she literally just dug the hole deeper for everyone who was already feeling upset about that. Um, That's an interesting point, because when I talk to the like the professional cosplayers, it's known that if if I'm in a competition, everything must be made from scratch. Mm -hmm. Uh, They have to like share their processes. Uh, I guess share like the look guide or whatever you may call it. Like there's a lot that goes into it to where you know that nothing should be store brought. Uh, So for them, it's a known thing. But I think for the average, like if I hadn't spoken to them, I would have never knew that. I would have been at the competition too. Like, well, y'all ain't tell me that I couldn't buy my costume from Halloween Town. And so, you know, I would be shocked too. 
but that's uh, the thing, right? Like, I, I, I don't think like the people had it store bought, but then the way that the judge made her comment was insinuating, that insinuating people, it was right? Bought. And I feel like the from what I saw and what I heard, like people didn't have a store bought costume. So then it's like, why would you put that in your in your defense statement? For the for the pictures I saw, I didn't feel like any of them were store bought, and um, we had one of the. Uh, the finalist on Anime After Dark with us, mm-hmm. uh, which I'll get into in a bit because I caught some, I caught heat for that too. For but having the one. finalist on, or the conversation the, that took place, <laughs> the assumed conversation that oh. people thought I was going to have. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, but the talking to the other cosplay professionals, they said when it comes down to it, and they're judging, there were some amazing people up there, and they weren't there in person, so they can't speak for it. But if they're a judge. I'm not just looking at how impressive your cosplay looks, but it's a lot of details that go into it. Um, does your paint job look rushed? It, are your seams peeling? Is the how's the how's the glue job done? Like they take into factor all those things. So they were telling me like they weren't physically at BlurCon, but if they were there, they're sure the judges probably considered those things. None of them agreed with how the judge decided to state those facts or present that to the timeline and they all felt like she was in the wrong for coming down. Like it was condescending and insinuating things. Uh, But they definitely said that when it comes to cosplay competition, you know that you're going in knowing that you have to build all this stuff yourself. So like store broad is really out of the question. If you want to win like a a true prize, win a real competition. And then the other thing that they brought up was that, uh, that they, that they solidified for me is that, Sometimes costumes look really, really good in pictures, but in person, you can see all the details and you know, like, it looks good, but this is your first time. Like, you have a lot to work on technically before we can allow you to win this competition. So with that in mind, I, that's why I, I was really happy with DreamCon setup that they're, that not only that they have like multiple levels to it, but the way they went about like letting the fans be involved and, and letting there be a way that, people can win and, and none of the stakeholders in the room, because we're all stakeholders, right? We're, we're fans, we're professionals, you're the organizers. None of the stakeholders in the room have to feel slighted or feel like they weren't represented well up on the stage. Because the judges too want to make sure they pick someone that when it goes out, they're like, how the fuck did the judges pick this person? Like the whole cosplay is sloppy. So we're all stakeholders at the end of the day. Um, I like DreamCon set up because it allowed everyone to have some skin in the game and be able to walk away feeling good about themselves. Uh, the conversation that came after the cosplay competition with Anime After Dark was uh, when it happened, it just so happened that very same night we were doing uh, a, a, a convention do and don't on Anime After Dark. And so we decided to reach out to all the finalists from BlurCon uh, we DM'd, one of the finalists didn't have, uh, she didn't have a personal account. So we DM'd the person who was like managing all her pictures. And then we DM'd two other finalists and we, and then the winner, the the white woman, uh, her DMs were closed because she was experiencing what she was experiencing. So I had no choice but to at her publicly on the timeline. And I ended up telling her like, I do agree with your choice to cosplay, which I do. I don't think it's a bad thing. She was allowed in the space. She was allowed to pay her money. She was allowed to interact with everybody. Um, I agree with her being able to cosplay if that's the president that BlurCon set. Um, I don't think that anyone is in the wrong. I don't feel like the fans are in the wrong for feeling like they got ripped off and that, um, you know, they weren't safe and that their space was given away to someone else. I don't, but I, I also don't blame the girl who was allowed into the space and encouraged to go cosplay and allowed to spend her money, but you know, are you going to tell her like she can't participate in anything here? The only person I see at fault is the blurred con organizers, the people that are in charge that didn't set the space up to be productive and safe for our people. Uh, so with that said, when I when I added her and said like, hey, I agree with your decision to cosplay, I want you to come on Anime After Dark and speak with us. The main the main things I wanted from that was one. At the time, I didn't know anybody else that went to BlurCon. And all I was seeing on the timeline was people, like, talking a lot of shit. But that weren't I there. Asked, <laughs> whenever I asked somebody, they weren't actually there. They just knew somebody that knew somebody that was there. And so my reasoning first was, well, if we get all the contestants up there. They were all at BlurCon. So who better to speak to the experience than the people that were there? So first, I wanted to get some actual facts about what happened at BlurCon. 
Uh, second was I wanted to have the conversation that we're having today about we can't put the onus on just the people. Like we also have to hold the systems accountable and the system that BlurCon set up is a failure. It didn't work out. And the last conversation I wanted to have really was about just those safe spaces, like what makes it safe? Because you can be in an all black, like you may think that you want an all black space and that makes it safe, but I've been in all black spaces where they stolen our money, like giving us cheap products. Like I've had that experience before. So for me, I, I, I guess I'm just a little different in how I look at it. I want to make sure it's actually safe for me. And I just won't call it a safe space just because it's there and they tell me it's for me or market it as it's for me because BlurCon never said it's for me. It's just, oh, it's BlurCon. So you see that, you see that word and you assume like, this for us. Mm-hmm. When yeah. clearly it wasn't for us. Listen. Uh, like what you said, all all skin folk ain't kin folk. Like there's a lot they, of they people ain't. that like being in my community here that like where I'm from, that's like mostly like Latino and black. And like some of these people have been the most shadiest people ever. And I'm just like, oh, I thought we had yeah. each other's bag. Like sometimes it it is, it really is based on the people and not exactly like the background and stuff like that. And I love that you point that out because I think people are afraid to say that. And it's like, you're looked at like, oh, you're anti your own community, but it's like, we can be real about our own community. Yeah. And we, as people in that community, we are allowed to have criticism and to have valid concerns when we don't feel safe in the space one of the safest spaces i've ever been in was uh in italy and uh, i was backpacking in naples and they they fucking looked out for me and my drunk ass and the hostel that we were in was actually it was run by this guy mr santorini and i don't know what his i don't know what the man's background was but let's just say bro eats breakfast in the courtyard surrounded by men around his tent and it's like dudes on the roof and stuff watching him. And when someone walks up, like they got to talk to three different people before they. Oh can my get god! To him. <laughs> I, I don't really know everything he had going on, but like, it was different. And so, but like, he really made the people in his hostel feel at home. You felt safe. Um, you got we we ended up because um, we went out. So, uh, United States citizens and Australians. And especially if you add like some UK folks in the mix, we get rowdy when we mix up. I don't I don't know what that like melding of culture is, but we get rowdy when we mixed up. And so one of the all seasons ended up like getting a little bit too crazy and ended up like having an issue one of the nights when we was in Naples. And the whole thing was almost instantly squashed because one of the guys at the hostel comes up and he's like, yeah, there is such and such hostel and that's smoked. It ain't happening. And pretty much everybody instantly chilled out like, well, can't fuck up business for this guy. We just going to go about our way. And so that was a safe space. And I didn't even have to know the people there, but the way it was set up. And, and when we got to the hostel, he told us, like, as long as you're with us and, like, you good, you're going to take care of everything. And I didn't really know what that meant, but, like, seeing how things went that night, it felt really safe, like, being there that night. Uh, so, like, things like that, I guess, just broaden my perspective. Like, it doesn't just have to be one way. Uh, with that being said, I, I do love feel that a f- story, by the way, before you move on, I just, I love, oh. I love like travel and I love like, oh, that was so cool. So thank you for sharing that tidbit. Oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a travel freak. We can talk all day about travel. That's, <laughs> that's what I love to do. Uh, with that being said, I do have like, I'm not, I'm not totally flexible with like, I just want to go anywhere. I do have demands and stuff I want in spaces. Like I do go in spaces and and I want my black experience to be highlighted. I do want representation. I do want to see those things. Uh, I have those demands. Like if you have a space and you market it to me, then I make sure I get that, that I make sure I get that from you, especially if I spend my money. And if I spend my money and you don't deliver on that, you don't see me anymore. You won't hear from me. Like I'll just cut it off. And normally I don't make an outrage. I'm just done. I, I don't, uh, I'm not one that believes in like really feeding into like negative things. So I don't give my voice to things I feel really negative about. I just try to leave it as is and hopefully it just dies out. I don't want to feed the flames at all. Uh, so I do have those demands for spaces. Like uh, for DreamCon, I felt really taken care of but my demands there, like, you know, 
security. Let's let's take care of security and everything. Let's let's have the things here that's supposed to be here, and uh, let's make sure that it stays safe for us. Because there there are some parts where uh you know some people have real real blades and real swords in the convention, and it's like what? Okay, <laughs> but we got we got this. We we only have one layer of security, and so like coming from aviation, I've worked in security a lot. So like you need multiple layers of security and I'm just looking at the process. You basically have us coming in one door. There's one layer of security and they're doing their fucking job. They're working their ass off where they are. And if you come through there, like everything's happening as it should happen. But then there's a side door. Um, and because of the setup, like I told you, it's in two buildings. So the side door that you use to get to the hotel, there's no security over there. And then at a certain point, security had pretty much migrated to the main door. So if you come in through the side door, you can walk through the whole convention without ever experiencing security, which for me was a prop. That's scary, yeah. And and not and not saying that any of these people are here on bullshit or they're gonna do something, but you never know. Like it, you never know when a fight could break out or anything could happen. Like we don't we don't know what could happen. Anything could happen, and you just want to make sure like stuff like that is secure, especially when you're like having all these bodies in one space, you want to make sure like you minimize the risk and the liability, not just for me as a fan, but for you as a business owner too. Like, I don't want to see DreamCon taken away because two dudes freaked out and now we got a lawsuit out and, you know, now they're struggling to do DreamCon because that's a beautiful event. So uh, just things like that. Like if we're talking about protecting uh, our blackness or protecting our black spaces. It's not just about protecting me as the fan. It's about protecting your business and your assets and making sure that your space can survive. Like you now have an obligation to us to keep that alive and, and hold on to that ownership and that equity and make a better space so that other people can be inspired and grow to do the same. Absolutely. And I think too, it's just what you said, like those things, like you're looking at it bigger picture. And I feel like as creators, like we, we need to look at that, like for each other, because we want to see each other win. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. hopefully I, I hope like your thread makes it to the eyes of the organizers of DreamCon, because I feel like that and what happens, not saying DreamCon would do this or anything like that, but what happens often when you're critical of something is that people immediately turn it into hate. And so oh, you a hater, blah, blah, blah. Y'all can't just let people enjoy things. And it's like, We can enjoy things, but we can also be critical of them because we want to see you win and we want to see you. You know, the thing you said about safety, I immediately just think that I saw some of our mutuals were there with their kids. Like, so now you telling me props aren't being checked and I got my daughter out here like that to me immediately is a, you know, red flag. And it's I think obviously to like you give grace because, you know, they're putting this together after COVID and this is kind of like the first thing back, but it's like, definitely, I hope you're what you've highlighted is put into their eyes. And I think this is also why it's important for these organizations to do press, to have Mm -hmm. uh, people of the press there, because these are the people that are going to be telling you areas that you need to improve. So next year. So if you don't have the budget to do maybe a consultant, you can work with other creators and be like, all right, let's get your feedback and see how we can put these into action. Yeah. And and not to toot my own horn. I feel like a lot of my feedback was valid. Cause like I said, the, the cosplay uh, organizer, she reached out to me and um, confirmed a lot what I was saying and also stated her case. So I ended up making a slight correction to my thread to let it be known. Um, Cause I felt like she was shady towards the winner, but she expressed that she was just extremely tired and like burned out and which led into something else that I mentioned in my thread where I felt staff was very short. I felt like they were very understaffed and some staff members reached out to me and commented on my thread about um, apparently there was an issue with people signing up to be staff and getting in the convention and then going to be fans and not really doing their job. And so like, it's just small things like that. And all these things are small things. Like, as I said at the beginning, DreamCon was an amazing experience and I don't, I don't knock them at all for this, for them to like step up after the pandemic and really upgrade and, and do it on this large of a scale for the first time ever like that is a huge that is a huge jump and I can't say enough about the work and everything that went into it and for the people that were working I saw Ben running back and forth I saw multiple staff members like on their job doing everything they could like they really worked their ass off the security worked their ass off at the door they were at 
And so um, for the people that were working and doing what they had to do, they did awesome, like hats off to them. Uh, and just all the little things, those are the things that add up to make big problems. So I hope that we can just bring, or I can bring light to some stuff if it does make it across people. And it can say like, hey, let's adjust these small things and make sure like that doesn't happen in the future. Cause we don't, we don't want some, some random happening. Like uh, with the staff members, uh, that was just, that was crazy. When the girl told me on Twitter that, you know, people are signing up just to get into the convention for free and be able to meet the creators and stuff so they can like, cause come on, have some professionalism and right. care about what you're doing. And uh, you want to like, you want to put our people, employ our people and make sure our people are there. But uh, the, the executor side of me, the one that makes decisions for organizations in the government is like, do you got to outsource that company? Like, like how do you even solve that? Mm-hmm. Or, or the other side of me is like, does it make sense just to do an all staff and all creator like two hour meet and greet before the convention? Like we having a powwow and we finna throw this awesome, awesome ass convention. All staff are here, the creators here. You can meet them. You can get all that out your system before we start the convention. And now you can go to work. Right. That's a, for one, that's a great idea. Two, it's stuff like that. That makes me sad because I feel like that's out of people's control. You know what I mean? Yeah. But then it's like, what is the vetting process where people being vetted, where people, you know, like, because I, I, now that I'm more in the con space, I'm following conventions. So I'm seeing like, we're looking for staff. Here are the requirements proof that you've been at other events, other cons, similar or other type of thing. Cause there's people that are like professional, like con staff and they've been, you know, cause I saw a yeah. thread um, and I'll, I'll be sure to link it in the episode. It was a really good thread about um, like, there's a certain con like group that they're like filled with like predators and shit. And so there was like, it's just like the head of the convention has been like multiple times sexual assault allegations, like being like weird and pervy. And they have been multiple complaints about like from guests and stuff like that. So there was a whole thread about that. That's and the then, shit we got to cancel. That's right. what we got to cancel. No. And there's like a huge, I'll, I'll send you the information on Twitter because I think you would love like not love that this is happening, but just kind of, yeah, because it's like, it's a certain group that they, that is, that is a part of, and they've been like canceling them. And a lot of voice actors don't attend those cons. Like they won't be involved with that based on those, on those things. And then there was another one that somebody, so the reason that I found that thread was because somebody else was like, just in the topic of cons, like here are from somebody who's been a, a like at a con person for 20 plus years as staff, like things that you should look at, like red flags on some conventions. So I'll find those threads because I think you would love them just based on your background and this type of stuff. Because the one about cons being shady, that one was really good because I did realize like in the past, some of the cons that I went to could have been shady <laughs> and been like, like just based on, you know, like, it, it was it was really good. Like it even talked about like boiling down to vendors that they have or like the staff, how they're how they're advertising their guests, what kind of guests that they have, you know, what how they're planning panels and shit like that. And it was, uh-huh. it was really well constructed. So I'll be sure to find that and share it with you because I think you would um, like that. I would love to keep you for 10 hours because me and you, we here with these conversations. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I do want to wrap up because I know you're going to do anime after dark um, as well. Um, so with that, the... I want to ask you like a final con question and then I want to ask you some fun anime questions. Um, okay. Do you see yourself or do you want to be in that space organizing conventions? Because clearly like, you know the shit that you're talking about based on your background. Is that an interest of yours? I definitely uh, tried to shoot my shot to DreamCon on the timeline and told them. If, I'll tell them too. If, Let me know. If I could be like, I don't even have to have a whole last position because I, I have a day job that I like. But even if I could just be a part of it, just to be in a room, seeing what goes into it, talking to people about it, I'm just interested in those type of things. Uh, I've, uh, I did pro bono consulting for a while when I was backpacking. That's pretty much all I did was pro bono consulting, just going business to business, learning about different industries and and seeing how and why people do what they do. Because it's something I just, I love. I love the people watch and I love to know what makes people tick and what makes things turn. 
So if I could be a part of DreamCon, even if I'm just there, like chopping it up with people like, hey, well, have we considered this? And what do y'all think about this? Um, whatever capacity, I would love to be a part of that and just see. And you never know, like it may get to the point where the podcast becomes, um, the podcast, everything comes from it. And, you know, blessings be if it turns into a studio or whatever else comes from it. I may be in a position where I do want to do my own convention one day or something like it. So having that having that experience and that exposure would be excellent. Not to mention just experience. I just like doing shit. Same. And also <laughs> we're speaking that into existence. We are here about it from your mouth to the universe's ears. To the universe. Listen, I'm here for it. I, I think you'd be great at that. And like I said, I love these type of technical conversations because you do, it's so easy online to see something immediately be like, like I see people dogging blurred con out and I'm like, wait a minute, like the, the organization, yes. But like the experiences, like a lot of people had a really good time. Like there's, you know, there's multiple sides. I always say this, that my mentor told me, Multiple things can be true at the same time. And exactly. people do not like that doesn't click for them. And it's like, yes, this terrible thing happened or this very negative thing. But it doesn't take away from this other truth that people did go and have fun and, and do this. So I think all of those things are important um, to bring to the table. So I want to thank you for having that conversation. And before you go, I just want to know a couple of anime things from you. Uh, okay. So what are you currently watching right now? Um, currently watching, so I, I just did a Gundam episode. It hasn't aired yet, but it's going to air in two weeks. Uh, and so I am currently watching Gundams. I just watched a Gundam movie, Hathaway. And I just started, uh, I just restarted Iron Blood Orphans. I had watched that in the spring, so I'm re-watching that. And then next up on my list, they told me I need to watch... Uh, uh, some Super Sentai because that's also a mech thing. So I, I'm thinking I'm going to do uh, like a Power Rangers or something, I think is what they recommended to me on the episode. And then I'm going to check out some, uh, it's supposed to be like Voltron, but not quite Voltron. But I forgot what the title was that he named it. So those are what's on my list. The main thing I'm reading right now is Bleach. Has anyone that is following me may know I am in a competition with Mike. If I read Bleach, he will read One Piece. So I have bit the bullet and I am currently reading Bleach. Ooh, uh, I like that. I like the series. I can't stand Ichigo. And uh, yeah, I, I feel like Ichigo is detracting from the series for me. Um, but I do like the series so far. And Isn't he the I'm main so, character? <laughs> he's the main character. I, like the, I can't even get into it because I, I just got into it. We just we just had like a it. we just had like a full day text chat of me, Sensei, Mike, and Leek talking about these dudes, and I'm just I'm tired of Ichigo. <laughs> uh, but I it's other characters in the series I absolutely love. I fucking love them to death. Um so it's been good. And then I'm trying, of course, I'm staying up to date on One Piece. Uh I'm still reading that week to week. And I've been reading solo leveling because that's an easy read for me to do when those chapters drop. And I'm probably going to have to pick up like, oh, hey, how's it going? Welcome to the pot. <laughs> she like loves to show her face. <laughs> uh, and then I'm going to have to probably pick up uh, like My Hero and some other stuff to get back on my grind there because I've been letting those chapters go. So do you, um, like, for example, with My Hero, are you watching and reading at the same time? Um, I'm not watching much of anything right now. Like these, I, I'm squeezing these these mech episode, these mech series in because it's part of what I'm doing for the pod. But just the way my new job and personal life is set up, reading has been the preferred method for me right now. Same. I completely <laughs> understand because I've been on a super manga kick. Like last fall, I was really heavy on watching anime, um, but it goes through phases. Like I'd be mad busy yeah. too. So I'd be like, all right, like, let me let, like I caught up on my hero this weekend on my flight and I have a couple of flight, like I'd be taking my airport time. That's when I'm watching anime because I'm like, of like that. So um, I, your, your, your comment about, eat, I haven't watched Bleach. Um, my husband's into it. And like, I have like this Bleach shirt that I wear. Cause I don't give a fuck. I'm gonna wear that shit. Even though I don't watch it because Talissa, you're not gonna Talissa fucking weep. 
<laughs> so listen, we what's your top five? I'll name like, name <laughs> the top five swordsmen in, in bleach. He's listen, like, Get the fuck out my face. <laughs> and it's so funny because I have like a bunch of Dragon Ball Z and Naruto shirts. Um, mm-hmm. haven't watched those either, but I just I love anime, like I love anime merch. So mm-hmm. But then, like, you know, I'm ready at any moment to do a think piece about Deku. Nobody want to talk about it. The minute I wear a Naruto shirt, everybody, everybody and their mama. Bitch, no. Talk to me about who I could make a dissertation about. But that's not their the fault. Tru- the truth is, the truth is that them same people that's questioning you, they recognize Dragon Ball Z and Naruto because those are the only two, like, they've seen or even, like, watched part of. And so now they feel like, well, I've seen these, so I can question you on these. And if I act a certain way, you'll never know that I'm also exposed and I'm out here not knowing anything. So, um, listen, listen. We, <laughs> you're not getting me. <laughs> we, uh, we, I actually saw it in effect at DreamCon. Like a guy was questioning a girl, and then the dude, the dude in the circle with him is like, well, how did you feel about blah, blah, blah? Guy goes silent. <laughs> So I was like, oh, okay. So, yeah, I'm finding out that happens more often than not. The whole, like, gatekeeping women mm-hmm. thing was new to me. It was made it was made known to me after I started the podcast. I wasn't aware that, that was really a thing. And so, like, even now when women tell me some of the shit that they go through, I'm like, no. Really? Who would do that? Like, why do they even care? Listen, and so, lames. Like, it's and it's my, like what it's you said. Boggling. It's like what you said. They, they like, I'd be like, all right. Ask me about Javin Ball Z. Okay, what about pre tier, bitch? What about Kekkapta <laughs> Sakura? XX, like, k- k- bitch, my whole anime collection worth more than your fucking car. Like, let's start there. But that has never, like, happened to me to that level where I could flex like that. And it probably isn't worth more than their car. But don't let, don't let me catch somebody catch me on the wrong day because I will be happy to flex. Um, and they, don't, <laughs> they don't have to know whether it's worth more than their car or not. Just you saying that is a lie. And that's going to that's gonna destroy their whole self-esteem. They might not show it in the moment when you hit them with it, but they're definitely going to be at the crib like, I ain't doing shit with You know that sound? Like that <laughs> meme that be like, like when people get hurt, they'll be like, Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that shit cracks me up. But your, your thing about Ichigo just made me laugh. And I want to ask, just to be messy, what is like a current like anime opinion that you have that you know you unleash this in the clubhouse or whatever, you about to get flamed. On like a current anime? Yeah, something like a current thought that you have had. Um, I think that Fire Force as a manga is better than most of the, the current series is out that people be talking about. Like I found it, I, I'm on record not liking season one of the anime but when I read the manga, it presents it, it presents it much better. Mm-hmm. And now I can go back and watch season one and understand what's happening better. Um, but the the series of Fire Force is better than half the shit we'd be talking about. And I don't feel like Fire Force be getting the praise that it deserves. Preach. I have not I, I, I say this every podcast, but I feel like I just have to say it. I will not read the manga and I will buy it because I'm crazy until the anime is finished, just because like I can't. Like, cause then like I get expectations then I get sad, whatever. So I'd rather just finish the anime, but fire force. I saw this, like I started the first season and I kind of like fell off and then I finished the first season and I was like, holy fucking shit. Like I really enjoyed it. And I, I haven't finished season two yet, but that's one of those where I'm always seeing the timeline. Like y'all sleeping on fire force. Yeah. But I feel like people sleep on it. Like and for me, se- season one was beautiful. And it's the sound design on season one is out out this world. Mm. And the intro, Inferno, is one of my favorite intros of all time. I'm not Repeat. even going to stunt. But just something was missing in season one for me. So I was like, yo, it's kind of a flop for me. It's a dud. And I had, maybe me too, I had high expectations walking into Fire Force because I'm from a firefighting family. So, like, I was just ready to all just be <laughs> fanning out. And it just wasn't <laughs> that for me. But I, I go and read the manga, and the manga has what I'm looking for. And really what it is, is like the you get a deeper look into, into Shinra's mind, and it makes all the other stuff make sense. And so the manga's gas, the, the, the concept of it, especially like as you get to figure out everything that's happening behind the scenes, I fuck with it. And I think that it should have been in the place of other anime that, of course, it's, it's better than Demon Slayer to me, but there are other anime we talk about, especially from like its its rookie year that 
Fire Force is better than, but I don't think it gets the love. Somehow it ends up in that in that mid range conversation where mm-hmm. like it's not bad, but it's not good, but really it's good. It's undervalued. I agree. What is an anime genre that you do not like or that you just like never, you don't, mm, you're not about it? Uh, slice of life, traditionally, things that are that are more slice of life than anything else, they put me to sleep hella quick. I just don't do mundane. It's not, it's not my experience. Uh, it's not for me. But if you add slice of life elements, I'm learning after all the the hate I took from Panda, uh, if you add slice of life elements to other, you know, things like like comedy and put some action in there and stuff, I'm learning that I like that. So just when it's too heavy slice of life, I'm I'm bored out of my mind. I don't want to sit through that. I love slice of life, man, child. Woo. It just doesn't. I can't. It doesn't hold my attention, and I'll. I, I want to, like, I, I want to be, I want to, like, experience it and consume it and be able to talk on it, but every time I try, like, I'm I'm knocked out. It it does the same thing to me that Inuyasha does. It puts me to sleep. This interview is canceled. I am leaving. This never happened. I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> but I love, I love Inuyasha for that. When we was at DreamCon and we got super drunk on night one, uh, Poodle and Kasha turn on Inuyasha and tuck me in to help me sleep. Cause uh, I had like cleaned up the whole Airbnb. It's like 6.30, seven o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I'm tired and like, we got just the thing. This finna knock you right out. And so they put the blanket over me and turned on any Yasha. When I tell you I passed straight out, it was it was like comfort to my soul. It brought back all the memories that I remember from high school, falling asleep. And then, but that outro came on and definitely woke my ass straight the fuck up. Ooh. Listen, <laughs> well, I'm glad that you had that experience. <laughs> I love, I, I did an Inuyasha rewatch last year and I, I haven't uh-huh. finished. It's still on my list to finish. Um, but you know, COVID, we had mad time to be watching shit. I don't, I don't really have time to watch stuff. But I, uh, listen, Inuyasha, Slice of Life, that's my jam. What is an anime that people would be surprised that you like really fucked with? Uh, I don't know because I talk about everything yeah i guess it's Um, if not surprised like just not like your usual that you would go to i get a lot of people to tell me they're surprised that i read my hero because i i very rarely talk about my hero but it's an it's an acquired action of mine because i can't stand the my hero fandom and after having conversations with them i decided like well i'm just not gonna talk about this ever i'll just keep my love for this series to myself so I've had I've had plenty of people tell me like I didn't know you even read or watched or cared about my hero. You rarely talk about it. And so yeah, I get that a lot. I, I just, was I late. In a fandom. It, they're, they're a little. I mean, says so I'm sitting here with my hero shirt. Yeah. I but I too am not very into fandoms with stuff because again, I'm sensitive. I don't like arguing with people. You not go. <laughs> I mean, I will. Don't get me wrong. I went on the. I was a guest on the Sailor Moon Fan Club podcast, and I went on this whole debate about Deku. Well, it wasn't a debate because uh, Victoria agreed with me. We were talking about Deku and Sailor Moon just being like amazing people, even though people think they're crybaby babies. And I was like, this is gonna be That's my cap. master. That's, That's big cap. And we can we can discuss it. That's big cap. They are not crybabies. Oh, I thought you meant like that they weren't like I was like, wait a minute. Look at look at you getting sensitive. No, I'm uh, <laughs> I told you I'm sensitive. I'm, I'm an artist and I'm sensitive about my shit. Like exactly. I get that feelings hurt. So that's why I don't debate with people. But she's I, going on I, tour, by the way. Who? Erica. Oh, I was like, Deku is going on tour. No, Erica Erica Badu is going on tour. Oh by the my way. god, I would so love you know. I would love to see her. Uh, we just, but we just brought tickets. I'm excited. Yes. No, I literally. This is why I don't debate with people because I I get in my feelings because I really be like no, but but I was on the my hero. I, like I didn't like dislike it or anything. I just didn't get into it. And then I saw the first episode and I was like, this is canceled. I'm never watching this ever again. And my friends like. Lisa like they made it that way like she kind of explained to me that it's there's parts of my hero that are like parodying like superhero stuff so when she explained that to me I was like all right like I went back and now I'm like obsessed but I'm also like keep my feelings to myself because I'm not about to sit here and argue with you because I got hands virtually Mm -hmm. don't see me in real life that may not be true but I will get you these hands virtually but I'm not going to do that (laughs) um but my last uh... 
No, go ahead. <laughs> before, you, before you get your last question, we did an episode with Noxie a while ago, and he gave his take on the whole Deku crybaby thing because uh, we were talking about it. I was like, that's big cap. Like, yeah, bro cries and he has these emotions, but he's 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 a fucking child. Like, what you want? He's fighting in worldwide battles, like the devastation that he's seeing, people getting hurt, the gore, all that. And then he's still dealing with like regular child problems and stuff. What do you expect him to do? And so Nox's take on it, uh, shout out to Noxie Project Manga, by the way. Uh, Noxie's take on it was that he feels like a lot of the fanboys, um, they're, what they like about anime is that they can look at what their ideal self, self would be. So like the person is like, that don't hurt me and fuck that. And I'm gonna keep trying and I'm I'm a, I'm the man's man. I'm gonna win in the end and I'm tough. And so he's like, that's what people wanna relate to. And when they see Deku, they probably see a little bit too much of themselves in Deku. It's a little bit too relatable. And so rather than be able to accept that and, and, and bond with that character, they shun that because they don't wanna also be seen as weak and they treat Deku like he's weak when he's not because Deku is still doing all the things that your favorite ideal character is doing. He's just a little bit more relatable. He's going through a, a larger emotional spectrum, and it ain't nothing wrong with that. It's yeah. actually refreshing to experience that in an MC. So uh, I really fucked with Noxie's take. I agree. And anybody that's still using the same old ass Deku or Crybaby take, you got to come up with new material, bro. It's dead. It's 2021. Listen, that was a beautiful take and I could not agree more because people don't like seeing themselves. You know, a lot of times you don't like like these gems, my mentor uh, dropped them. But another thing that he says um, that he kind of like if you have a problem with something like that's a reflection on you and not mm -hmm. on them. And it's the same thing. If somebody has a problem with you, that's a reflection, reflection on, them. on them. So I, I could, that was beautiful. Not shout out to you. We about to re, I'm about to reach out so we can have this Deku dissertation because I couldn't agree more. And I feel that way with Sailor Moon too, right? Like in this ideal world, you were being an anime. You feel like you're going to be fucking Aaron Yeager, like kicking ass and shit. Yeah. And then you really going to be Armin in a corner having a panic attack. Like, you know, like you're not, yeah. I think our RCD, um, RCD world, they have this skit when it's like, they're like, when you're walking by an anime villain and, oh, they make best friends with you. And they're like, oh, yeah. I would sacrifice my life for you. <laughs> and then that kind of reminds, their skits make me, so it, it touches upon that, whether they realize it or not, what people think they would do in anime world until it really is happening. So, and you're so like, the shit gets real. You're like, I'm not about this life. Bitch, I'm basic AF. <laughs> but I guess, I guess it's also like, what, what is your purpose in consuming? So like when I'm consuming, like I said at the start of this episode, I'm taking lessons. Like I'm in it for realism and relatability and perspective and story. There are people that literally just consume for escapism mm -hmm. and fantasy. And if that is what you're here for, then I guess at some level I can understand why a character like Deku would be off-putting to you and you want a character like Goku. Like you prefer Goku over Deku. At some level I can get your mindset there if you're just there like... Yeah, I just want to throw hands and I could take anybody in the universe. I could get it. I'd be like, no, nah, you can't, but go ahead though. <laughs> go ahead. Though. No, I, I get that because I too am very emotional. And like, I mean, there's some manga that like shaped my whole entire life. Like I literally would never be the same person if it wasn't for that series. So I like take that's why I said I take shit personally because I'm a sensitive person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that's why I identify with Deku and Sailor Moon because I'm into, but I think that's a positive. Like, I don't see that as a negative and a lot of people do. Um, but that's also another conversation for another day. I wanted to, to end, I'm um, just asking you, are there anything that's coming up, whether it's this year, whether it's anime, whether it's manga that you're looking forward to coming out? Uh, well, number one that I'm looking forward to, and I hope I can make it is C2E2 in Chicago. It's a convention. Uh, it's not just anime and manga, it's all nerd shit, but it's back in my home city uh, with multiple people in the community, like Mike and Nay, and of course Sensei, because he's in Chicago. Uh, they saying they're going to be there, so it'd be dope if we can just do another B&B &B and have a good-ass time. Uh, the number two thing I'm probably looking for is I plan on starting video for the podcast this fall, and so it's something I've been wanting for a while. Uh, the podcast is constantly humbling me because I have a lot of dreams, but I don't have the resources to do all of them yet. So uh, hopefully I can get the video done, the video aspect of the pod rolling in the fall, and we can have just something else to offer the fans. I'm really excited about that. 
And uh, I guess the third thing I'm most looking forward to is um, more One Piece. I've really been loving the Wano arc. And uh, but we we already been in this arc for like two and a half years, three years. I'm ready to like get to like start moving towards conclusions and have like wrap ups and uh, ready to see what's next in the One Piece world. Like it's been a lot of interesting things happening. Some things I agree with, some things I don't. But I want to see where Otis taking this. I love that. And um, follow up question: Do you have any other conventions that you've already planned for the year that you're going to? Uh, definitely trying to set the money aside for DreamCon and C2E2, so DreamCon 2022, but the tickets drop like the same weekend. And how, how am I going to get my money right, DreamCon? Right, how? right, right. What do you, like, I just left. Give me some time, bro. Christmas ain't even here yet, bro. Exactly, man. <laughs> Can I get like two or three paychecks? Rent due, utilities due, like, God stuff damn. happening. So, uh... <laughs> Definitely trying to do DreamCon. Definitely want to try to be press, vendor, panelist, all that at the next DreamCon. Same thing for C2E2. Uh, I've discussed, because my, my girlfriend's kind of getting into uh, anime and manga. I'm slowly getting her to read strategic things. I've pushed her away. Uh, I want her to go to Anime Expo with me. I don't know if she'll agree to that, but I would like to, us to take a road trip to Anime Expo and cosplay as uh, uh, Sweat and Soap and dress up like that. I'd be geeked up. Listen, let we're gonna have a, have the whole another episode about sweating. I mean, I I mean, I've done the videos, I've done the TikToks. I'm obsessed with. Sweat. I haven't read. I just got the seventh one. I haven't read it yet. So that was the first manga I ever got her to read. She loved it, so I kind of want to get her to go, and we can cosplay like that. Let me send if she loves it. Let me send her my list because look, <laughs> that's I I, I, I never got into that genre. Up. Like until recently, like this year, like I've been super into. I was like, why was I sleeping on this shit? Because I'm a cypher life girl. But yes, where is Anime Expo this year? Uh, it's it's in. I go to the one in Los Angeles. Oh, I was actually just in Arizona on a layover. It was hot as balls. I was like, poor you guys. You um, should have DM me. I work at the airport. I already got you some food. I had no idea because I, I was I went to Palm Springs, so I was there on a layover oh, okay. on my way back. But on my way there, I was at a layover in Dallas. But my my layover in in Arizona was like three hours. Oh, OK. Yeah. So there's a couple cons that I'm going to. Um, I kind of just been like going crazy with cons. So I'm going to Otacon this weekend, which is in D.C. I'm only going for one week, like one day, though, because I just could not get an Airbnb. Like, I was like, all right, y'all, like, whatever. I'm just going to go for this one day. Because it's like three. Yeah, it's three hours. I live like an hour outside of Philly. So it's just three, like two and a half hours from me. So I'm going to do Otacon. I already had, like, I'm so mad because I, like, did the, pre- their their press team has been fantastic. But I have an interview scheduled with um, Muriel from My Hero Academia. But I really wanted nice. Adam from JJK because I interviewed Megami. Oh, my God, I'm obsessed with him. And I was like, damn, if I interviewed Adam, I would have brought him one of my sweatshirts. But um, he's he's only had availability on Friday and I work Friday night. Um, but then I'm going to Orlando next week for Megacon. And then I just been I like I've been applying crazy. And then when they approve me, I'm like, oh, shit, I got approved. Let me find a way to get there. So then I'm going to go to um, Megacon in Orlando and then there's Supercon in Florida and I'm just like I want I need to apply for Anime NYC but that one I'm like I need to get some let me get some other these interviews because I mm-hmm. I applied before and they were like bitch who the fuck you you are canceled yeah. uh, so I'm I'm trying to like at these cons once I get these interviews scheduled and published I'm gonna apply and be like all right now take me seriously cons. I might have to uh, pick your brain about what's the best way to move into like doing press and all that other stuff because I, I haven't done those things traditionally for the pod. We've basically just been, you know, important. But I want to add the press aspect. So I'm going to have to, like, pick your brain on what you got going on and how oh. to do that. And also Absolutely. how we can link up at a con in the spring. So listen, cause when, I, when I tell you the best part about the con experience has been meeting the people, like, we've made friends with on Twitter, meeting the community. And, like, that dream B&B was lit. All the creators in there and everyone's talking, having a good time. And shout out to them for not being fake. It's so often you meet people from the internet and they're not 
at all who you thought they were going to be. Mm-hmm. But everybody was genuine. Like, everybody showed up. They were the same way. Like, I couldn't have asked for a better experience at DreamCon. And that has me excited about C2E2. Any convention I do in the future, if there are going to be other creators there, like, I just want, I want to meet people, man, and just meet yes. folks in person and, like, talk it up, chop it up. And this is why I love this podcast. I feel like everybody who comes on my podcast, like I genuinely like I'm somebody that's very picky. So I only like invite people that I feel like we're not that we're going to have the same thought, but like that we vibe with. Because I feel like once yeah. you're on my podcast, like you my friend and then I'm going to start acting like we're <laughs> friends in real life. So but that literally like this year, like getting to meet Naja, me and Victoria planning to meet up. Me and Erica already got plans to meet up like that type of stuff. Like. I'm just so, and there's like another convention at the end of this year, Anime Frontier in Texas that I like apply to too. And I'm just like, if I get approved, whoever's in Texas, like uh, Mike Sine, come through. I know- um, my, my check is out there now too. Yes, uh, he just moved over. Like, I'm like, listen, we are all meeting up and that is an amazing, like that experience is just, it, it validates what you feel because like, like last year, like all my friends moved out of my area. So they all went to different states. And then like, I really was heavy online. And I'm like, yo, like there's people online, like me and Naja met up and we literally hung out the entire weekend. And it felt like I'd known that girl for 20 years. Like we just clicked on such a level. That's that, so crazy. And this is what, if anybody takes anything away, cause I get a lot of comments like, yo, that's the first time you talk to them on the podcast. Like, it seems like your friends, like if anybody is listening to this and you been, maybe there's a content creator you want to reach out to you've been like following them on hit them up because we're literally almost all like this where we are so welcoming and want people in the community because that's what makes it fun like anime recently has just been so fun for me because i know i'm gonna tweet some wild shit be about a 2d character being fine and panda gonna like it or somebody else gonna be like (laughs) girl i see you and it's like having that community is lit but i just want to thank you i don't get the whole 2d uh i don't get the whole 2d lust I'm, I I can't buy into that uh, into that trend. I don't it, don't don't. You're saying you you got a good head on your shoulders. Don't fuck that. <laughs> Maybe it's even the when, hair. Even when they do the waifus, like even the the waifus that I've chosen over time, it hasn't been about like they It's just been about like like Tamari has been my has been my favorite for some time from Naruto, just because like her personality and who she was and like what she meant to Shikamaru, Shikamaru who was also my favorite character. So like. I, I just never got the whole lust when people be looking like, that's my wife. She bad. I'm like, you're like, this is the lines on a piece of paper, sir. <laughs> right. So, I mean, that saying, but also like, sir, I think it, sir. <laughs> it's like the characteristics, <laughs> like, especially some of the shit I've been reading lately with Josie. I'm like, this man would be a dick in real life, but on paper, I love it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but I get you, but thank you so much for coming on this podcast. Of course, of course. This has been the fun and we'll have to do I now that I upgraded my zoom I want to have worse gen on because we talked about it before but I didn't have the right zoom but a bitch stopped being cheap and I'm paying for the for the full one now so we we in there <laughs> let's go you have been listening to the wonder of anime podcast hosted and produced by me Lisa Della Cruz this episode was mixed and engineered by Jared Brown at Music is Passion Studios. His links, the links to the guest, and any other topics that we talk about are available in the description box of this episode. If you've enjoyed listening, please be sure to share on social media using the hashtag TWOAPod and at The Wonder of Ivy. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>